All right. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to uh, get started with our first session for today. Uh, this session is the great MLOps debate. Uh, when talking to ML and AI teams about platform strategy, two of the big questions that always come up are, one, build versus buy, which we addressed uh, in our panel, uh, our panel on Tuesday, as well as our keynote yesterday a bit, uh, as well as, you know, what are the best tools to use to create a platform? Uh, and this end-to-end -end versus specialized question is a really interesting one. I wrote about it quite a bit in the definitive guide to ML Platforms ebook, um, which I talked about the wide versus deep uh, paradigm. Uh, I encourage you to check that out. I'm not going to go into the detail of that here, uh, but rather I am going to queue things up for uh, our panelists to debate it out. Uh, and with that, I would like to uh, hand things over to uh, my friend and friend of the show, uh, Demetrios Brinkman, uh, organizer of the MLOps community, to get things to get things started. If you can't tell from his avocado shirt, he <laughs> make sure that this is a fun session. Demetrios, that is right, Sam. Thanks for the intro, man. I tried to create a little uh, background, make it a little more interesting while we were in the green room there. So <laughs> we've got the great debate, man. I'm thankful that you asked me to come and do this again. I had a great time last year when we did it. And so now I'm, I'm looking forward to doing it again. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to turn it over to you. I guess I've got one more comment and that is, uh, let's see, I see a poll. Oh, the poll's already up. I'm going to let you take it away. Excellent. So I'll explain the poll in just a minute, but we've got... So much good stuff that's about to happen here. I hope you all are as excited as I am. I want to go through a few of the logistical pieces before we jump into the full on session and get into the debate. So let me explain what exactly it is that we are planning on doing. I'm going to introduce everyone that is joining us in just a minute. But first, what I want to do is talk to you about this cool giveaways that we've got. Everywhere I go, whenever I try and do some kind of virtual hosting, I try and get people to give us stuff so that we can give it to you that are listening. And today is no different. We've got Noah Gift here, who is one of the participants, and he wrote a book called Practical ML Ops. We've got a few of those copies to give away to people in the audience. So be active in the chat. Just like comment on everything that's happening and I'll randomly be giving those away throughout the debate. The other thing that I can give away are points. So anyone that is interested in getting more points, just be active in the chat. I'm pretty liberal with how I give them away. Now, the next piece that I want to talk about is the vote and the poll that we've got. You can see on the tab, there's a poll that is up right now. And what I want to do is figure out what's the delta, who wins this debate by how much they can swing the vote for back and forth. So that means that you go and you vote in the poll right now. And at the end of this session, you're gonna vote again and we're gonna see how much your mind has changed. So go into this. I just ask that you go into this open-minded and you allow some of these incredible debaters to change your mind if they have some things that make sense. All right, so what are the logistics of how this debate's gonna work? Well, first of all, we're gonna have each side. We've got two sides, we've got four contestants or four debaters. And each member, each debater is going to have three to four minutes to argue their point for or against and basically saying that there is one tool to rule them all or it's a best of breed solution. Next up, after they talk their talk for their three minutes, we're going to go and have them do one minute rebuttals because 
we don't know what everybody's going to bring up and they get to respond to some of the points that the other team has brought up and then from there i'll give some final thoughts i'll try and wrap put everything that i've heard into a cohesive statement <laughs> so that we can understand it that's where i may need your help in the chat eh? who wants some free books and then we will ask you to vote again and that's where we'll see what the delta is and who wins this debate all right so without further ado i want to introduce who is with us today and for the best of breed team the ones that are saying it is the best of breed they're arguing against that one tool to rule them all we've got dan jeffries my man and sean mohanty let's let's talk about who these guys are real fast dan jeffries just told me today that he is in berlin so i'm gonna go ahead and go out on a limb say his intro He's a futurist. He's also the managing director and kind of the brainchild behind the AI Infrastructure Alliance. Awesome. If you have not seen that, definitely go check it out. And now he's the CIO of Stability AI. You know, you may have heard of a little thing called Stable Diffusion. <laughs> and last but not least, the dude is a nomad. <laughs> Every time I talk to him, he's in a different place. It makes me quite jealous. Anyway, and... Now we've got Shyam, who is the CEO and co-founder of Watchful, a company that automates the process of creating labeled training data. Very useful stuff that we all know that we need. He's got decades of experience leading data engineering teams at companies like Facebook. That is a <laughs> company you've probably heard of. And... What he did while he was there was he served as the lead for the stream processing team responsible for processing 100% of the ad metrics data for all of Facebook products. If anyone has dove into the streaming ecosystem, you know what a feat that is right there. All right. So that is our best of breed team right there. Good luck, fellas. We'll see you in just a second. Next up, I want to introduce the one tool to rule them all team. Now, on this team, we've got Noah Gift and we've got Bindu Ready. Noah Gift, I mean, I, what's up, Bindu? I cannot hey. say enough things about Mr. Noah. I uh, have had the pleasure of meeting Noah in person in Portugal. He gave a talk at our MLOps community local meetups. That was incredible. He's also given various talks on our MLOps community virtual meetups. And as I mentioned before, he wrote the book, Practical ML Ops. You can find all kinds of his material on Pragmatic AI YouTube channel. He's got so much good material on there. I encourage anyone to go check it out. He's also teaching ML Ops courses. Maybe, I think it might be the first ML Ops course I've ever heard of being taught at a university. So ah, just good on you, Noah, for doing that. And now Bindu, is the CEO and co-founder of Abacus AI. Before Abacus, she was the general manager for AI verticals at AWS. She created Amazon personalization and Amazon forecasting. And prior to that, she was the co-founder of Post Intelligence, a deep learning company for social media influencers, which was ultimately acquired by Uber. And prior to that, she was at Google. So we've got quite the lineup here. This is some top-notch stuff. I'm excited to hear what you all got to say. I'm going to keep Noah on the screen because, Noah, I'm going to ask you to argue your point first. You ready for this, man? Sure, let's go for it. All right. I'm going to throw three minutes on the clock. And let's before we fully start, let's make sure everybody did the vote for the poll. Everybody do that, and let's see what we got. All right, we can. We might be able to throw up what it's. We'll at the end. We'll throw up the differences. All right, Noah, I'm giving it to you, man. 
All right. So a little bit about my background. Uh, I worked in the Bay Area for startups, enterprise companies. And so I have experience both in managing teams of people, managing companies, and then also doing the work myself. And one thing I really realized was that the um, building bespoke solutions is or picking risky technology is actually not a good strategy if you're running a company or running a team. As an individual, it actually feels great because you're 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 actually getting more and more power. So that's the really the scope of what I'm going to discuss in these five key points. So the first thing I'll mention is that uh, one of the more surprising things about uh, the startup industry is that uh, people are still entering them uh, because they're extremely risky. And if you look at uh, startups, uh, it's I think the the latest stats I found were that one out of 50 startup founders employ anyone other than the founder uh, after 10 years. And if you think about that, that from an expected value uh, position, right, you take the probability times the outcome. Most startup employees, their expected value is like 2000 versus a regular company. It's maybe 250,000. So these are really risky companies. And similarly, you can think of technology as a proxy for that. And so I think you should be very careful about taking a risk just because it sounds fun. The second is this concept of Nightian risk, which is a lack of any quantifiable knowledge about a possible occurrence. We don't know all of the details about what's going to happen with machine learning uh, in the future. For example, are people going to go to jail if they made bad recommendation engines? Or you know, is there going to be systematic bias that destroys society? You know, There's some real interesting problems here. And the more aligned you are with mainstream uh, technology vendors, I think you're, you're, you're reducing your night in risk. Third is hiring and maintenance are way, way easier if you take the biggest market share, right? So if you look about trained talent, you're going to get a, a bigger share of talent from the biggest companies. If you look at training material, they're going to have a wider variety of training materials. It's going to be easier to get your staff on board. Certifications, you can get people in your company certified. And then finally, you can call someone up on the phone after your star engineer leaves and actually get enterprise support to actually help fill in that role. So really continuity is a huge issue with uh, a platform. And then uh, the other one, as I mentioned before, is that if you're an individual, uh, and I guess I am right now, uh, you know, independent uh, for, for the most part, you have a lot of power if you pick very exotic solutions, because if you leave your company is in big trouble. On the flip side, if you're an employer and you want to have kind of uniformity and have uh, consistent results, you, you want to pick things where there isn't a key employee that's going to have the hit by the bus problem where if they leave the company or get hit by a bus, all of a sudden your company fails. The last thing I'll, I'll mention is that we actually have a lot of data around what's a good platform strategy. In fact, uh, the, the business author, Jim Collins, mentioned in Good to Great that technology uh, accelerates existing advantages in all of his analysis of the best companies in the world. It doesn't create them. And so I think it's a it's a mistake to think that you in a kind of uh, a single individual rule are going to heroically solve everything by creating this you know best of breed scenario when really you should pick boring solutions and accelerate the existing technology advantage. All right, that's my that's my pitch. Ooh. Coming out the gates hot there. I like it. I'm not going to take any sides as to not bias this audience, but that was strong. All right. We've got somebody else that is going to argue the other side of this. Let's see. Cheyenne, where are you at, man? Where are you at? Paging Cheyenne to the Here stage. I am. <laughs> you ready? You ready to ready. rebuttal and give Hope your... Me coach. Yeah. <laughs> Three <laughs> minutes on the clock. Here we go. All right. Um, so I, I think that was a fair argument for kind of like end-to-end -end platforms. Um, let me let me give like a counter argument. Um, first of all, kind of just to set the stage, uh, best in breed products or best of breed products tend to sort of push technological innovation forward. Uh, that, that's where a lot of technological innovation typically originates. End-to-end um, -end platforms tend to be slow innovating and, and often not fully encompassing. Um, we, we have to recognize the fact that real world machine learning problems are super diverse and it's very likely that you'll run into a shape of problem that doesn't quite fit with an existing end-to-end -end provider perfectly. Um, it might be able to do 75 to 80% of what you want it to do, but the remaining 20% you're kind of out of luck um, and that sucks. Now, on the other hand, with best of breed products, 
uh, you're able to sort of like incrementally build up your internal systems. And as, as a result, you're able to sort of de-risk the overall system as a whole. Um, so namely, you can start small, like buy maybe one, two small products that can kind of fit together like Lego blocks. And as your, uses, or your use cases expand, you can also expand your technology stack uh, and sort of like incrementally build it up. Um, now, by combining several of these best of breed products, you're able to really like tailor design a system for your organization and for your needs. Now, I know that a lot of the arguments against best of breed products are actually around like integration and support and, and sort of like, as, as, uh, as Noah mentioned earlier, um, that, that bus factor. Um, but really, I think like in today's age, a lot of that has been de-risked. Um, so especially with like the advent of containerization and, and like the widespread use of, of scheduler systems like Kubernetes, um, a lot of that integration risk is now de-risked simply because in the past you needed like in a data ops analog, you needed folks like um, a Cloudera or uh, a Hortonworks to implement things like Spark and, and Hadoop for you because it was very cumbersome to manage and, and that sort of thing. But now with things like Kubernetes, it's like, all right, just deploy a bunch of containers into the same environment and administrate it with the same grammar that you use to administrate everything else. Um, so in that way, there's very little integration risk because generally speaking, most companies now are moving towards kind of a containerized future. So you can use the same sort of um, logical constructs and the same systems to administrate all of your platforms. Um, and, and finally, like one last point, and I kind of touched on it just now, is we have prior art for this. Uh, there's, there's nothing to indicate that uh, the data science world, machine learning world is going to trend towards an end to end, like winner takes all solution, simply because most other industries haven't done that either. So if you take a look at most companies, you see installations for individual pieces like Salesforce, Dropbox, Slack, Zoom, Jira, and so on. Um, there's nothing indicating that data science or machine learning as a whole is going to be any different. Um, so that's, that's sort of my overall take. Um, you know, it, history points to the fact that uh, best of breed solutions tend to win because they fit best for the problems that you have. Ooh. Okay. I see you. I like it. So now we've got a little intermission because the results from the poll are in. Let's see what we got. Can we bring those up onto the screen? Can we see what the results for the poll were? Is that is that possible here? Let me see. IT, IT. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> we'll wait until the next one after. The <laughs> I'm about to bring up Bindu then. Um, let me, or maybe they're up and I can't see them. Oh, they're up and I just can't see them. So everyone, everyone can see them in the poll tab. All right. So if you go to the poll tab, you should be able to see it. Oh my God. This, the results for this are very strong, very strong. We've got best of breed that is showing up with a huge lead, gigantic lead. Okay. So... Whew. Bindu, no pressure, but this is kind of all on you to bring us home. All right, <laughs> I'm going to leave it up to you. You got three minutes. Let's put it on the clock. Hi, everyone. My name is Bindu Reddy, CEO and co-founder of Abacus AI, which is an end-to-end -end MLOps platform. So I'd like to like reframe this slightly. Obviously, there's never going to be one tool which rules all parts of AI. That's impossible to do. But end-to-end -end MLOps platforms make sense in the enterprise AI cases for common enterprise AI use cases, right? If you are like building an autonomous AI uh, uh, driving company or a robotics company, hell no, don't use an end-to-end -end, uh, MLOps platform. I mean, go build your own platform because it makes sense in that context. But if you are an IP or a GM or a Macy's, then of course you should use an end-to-end -end MLOps platform. Here's why. Without... Uh, uh, data, 
machine learning is useless for common enterprise use cases like say forecasting, personalization, you know, you know uh, text labeling and so on. So data and models are very intertwined with each other. And more importantly, if you build something and you don't know what, you know, what data sets went into that model, or you don't know what caused the drift, then you're not going to be able to do kind of model CICD. So for common simple enterprise use cases, it does actually make sense to have a tool which actually strings together all parts of the ML life cycle. So you can actually see what data you used, what features you used, how the model was built, how it, why something uh, is drifting and how to fix it. Imagine if you had a feature store um, you know, from one vendor, drift from another vendor. And let's say there was a model drifting, you wouldn't even know how to exactly fix it without a lot of like kind of communicating between the two vendors. So for you know, simple applications, end-to-end -end helps you actually debug your models easily, get to production e easily, and quickly go to um, uh, you know, multiple different models at scale. Now, uh, you know, Cheyenne mentioned that there is no kind of like, uh, you know, prior art to this. I actually strongly disagree. Uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, all believe in end-to-end -end MLOps platforms. SageMaker has the biggest market today. 99% of all enterprise AI today is an end-to-end -end platform. Uh, again, we're not talking about, uh, you know, some esoteric thing that NVIDIA might be building, or we're not talking about what Cruise is uh, doing. We're talking about standard enterprise AI and data science. And it makes a lot of sense to kind of build this in a way where you can see the beginning and the end of a particular problem. Classic problem would be churn. If you don't really know what, what feature is going to your churn model, or if that's sitting in a different vendor, it's going to be very difficult for you to interface between these different systems. And have you been in an enterprise? Do you know how long it takes to like actually get a best of breed uh, or any tool going? Now imagine getting 10 tools going. Now imagine getting those 10 tools to actually integrate with each other. Good luck with that. Um, the other, other case that Cheyenne made was, uh, uh, you know, Salesforce, Dropbox are all individual uh, platforms. Exactly. And therefore, this is one too. There's one, there are a few use cases for it, for which for uh, enter and ML ops to make sense, and and they are today in production, working in a large number of enterprises. So the market is already saying that. The second piece of this is, you know, what do companies like you know take for example someone like uh, Macy's or someone like Nike? What is their end goal going to look like? I strongly believe that the end goal is going to be a hybrid, where one is they're going to build models on their own based on their first party data. It's going to be an MLOps-like platform. And by the way, the same MLOps-like platform exists today in Google, it exists today in Netflix, it exists today in Amazon, Uber, everywhere. They all believe in end-to-end -end platforms. They haven't bought best of breed. Facebook, for example, uh, just released something called Looper. Uh, and uh, Google, uh, Uber obviously had Michelangelo for a long time. So and the end game is going to be an end-to-end -end MLOps platform for the first party data, but also APIs. Uh, I really like what OpenAI is doing. Uh, I think you know, to some extent, stability will do that too. What Hugging Face do is doing is great. So it's going to be a mix of these. We're going to use APIs and we're going to get like results for certain tasks, simple tasks. We're also going to have an end-to-end -end MLOps platform for first party data. That's how I see the future of enterprise AI. And finally, to the point of uh, you know, advanced applications, uh, you see Figma. Figma is a very good in-depth advanced application it has a lot of depth as well as breadth. So I think there's a false dichotomy here of saying it should be either deep or wide. I completely disagree. Figma actually got sold to Adobe for $20 billion. It's one of the best apps. It has both depth and width. We're in 2023, we can get both done. In fact, not only are the cloud lenders, I would like to think we, Abacus AI, are the best of breed end-to-end -end MLOps platform. Thank you. Ooh. Ooh, we got one more. Full debate tur. The master debater is coming up right now. Dan, where are you at? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, so, you're laying it on thick, man. You know, now I gotta deliver here. So <laughs> I'm just I'm just sad that you're we're not gonna see each other tonight. I didn't realize that you were in Berlin and now I'm, mm, so I gotta I'm leaving it at 50 50. Let, I mean let's see, you know, we're leaving it at 50 50. Anyway, before you start, I want to mention that there are some people in the comments that are doing an amazing job, and I got some books to give away. So, Peter, Nell, I think that's how you pronounce the name. Forgive me uh, if that is not how you pronounce it. You're getting a practical MLOps book. And Izette, 
you are getting some practical ML Ops books. And, and I got some points to give away. So, Angel, Mario, you get some points. We're going to be just giving those points away. I feel like Oprah right now. Who else wants a car? All right. Zachary, give Zachary some points. I'm going to give one more book away by the end of it. Let me know in the chat if you want a book. And let us get back to the final chat. And then we're going to have some rebuttals, a round of rebuttals. So, Dan, it's on you, man. <laughs> I'm going to bring it home here. Look, so the the answer to this is pretty simple. Um, you you can't have an end-to-end -end platform because it doesn't actually exist. Uh, it only exists in the mind of marketers uh, and in, in hype cycles. So, uh, you know, that's the main problem. For instance, you may desire it to exist. Uh, you may want it to exist. Uh, you may believe that it exists. But there's a delta between uh, reality and what we think about it. And... You're free to believe whatever you want. Um, you could believe that gravity doesn't exist. Uh, but if you go up to a 100-story window uh, and jump out of it, uh, you'll find out that gravity has an undefeated record, right? So I tend to look at things from a practical reality standpoint. And the fact is, when you think about the classic diffusion of innovation curve, where you have the invention and the early adopters um, and the early majority and the late majority and the laggards, we're still very much in the early adopter phase and, and so many of these tools are, are immature. Uh, and uh, even the ones that are starting to develop, you know, which we've seen in the uh, Infrastructure Alliance report where we surveyed over 300 uh, different companies, uh, there's different levels of maturity. When you think about all of the things that an MLOps platform has to do well, from ingesting the data, cleaning it, data versioning, providence, lineage, experimentation, training, distributed training, uh, you know, deployment, inference, monitoring, management. It's just impossible for any product at this stage, despite the marketing hype, uh, to actually be uh, fantastic at all of those things. Now, it is feasible if you have a very limited use case. You know, if all you're doing is churn prediction and basic analytics, uh, then you're probably fine, you know, with a single solution. If you've got a single data scientist with a laptop uh, trying to figure out your first ML problem, yeah, sure, one, one solution is going to do it. But if you've got hundreds or thousands uh, and they're all working together, it simply doesn't exist. There's no platform on the planet that can do tremendous distributed training like we do at, you know, stability or open AI there's, that can also do deployment and inferencing at scale uh, that has tremendous monitoring and management capabilities, plus a beautiful experimentation engine. It just doesn't exist. And if you look at something like some of the tools that we talked about, you know, earlier in, in my uh, you know, illustrious uh, panel stars, uh, think about something like SageMaker. You know, when we looked at SageMaker, the Infrastructure Alliance, you know, 90% of its use cases are, for, are structured data. So, you know, if you're using gigantic video and imagery and audio, you're, you're mostly out of luck. And, and so that's the problem. If you actually have a, a diverse set of use cases, it's simply just not going to fit in there. So that, that's the real problem. And if you look at something like Figma, it's one of the best tools of all time, like we talked about earlier. But the reason they bought it um, is because it's dramatically different than Photoshop. And Photoshop does a bunch of things that Figma simply can't do and doesn't try to do. And so if you're trying to do Photoshop level things in Figma, you're going to find yourself quickly out of luck. So what you're going to find out as you get into any sort of scale is exactly what other companies have found, that you're going to have a platform that you think does everything. And then when you start having a diverse set of use cases, you're going to quickly find out that that falls apart uh, when faced uh, with actual reality. Ooh, all right. Shots fired, as Virginia said. Virginia, you get a practical MLOps book, and I know just the person to give a rebuttal for this. Know where you at, man. I want to hear what you got to say because that was hot and heavy. Sure. I mean, I think it's really the nature of the human mind. Uh, the human mind gravitates towards low probability but exciting events. I'll give you two use cases. So uh, if you can get into Harvard and then drop out in your first year, you'll be a billionaire. But the probability is, you know, let's say one in a uh, hundred million <laughs> to, to do that. Likewise, uh, there the the majority of uh, people that play high school football probably think they're going to go to NFL, but there's a one in five thousand chance you'll even make the roster. And and so we're we're really 
thinking about things in an exciting way. Likewise, anybody with real world experience in the software industry knows that the bespoke solutions that get created, what it means is if you actually can create a bespoke solution for a corporation, most likely you're going to leave in a year to get hired by some big company because that company isn't going to take your bespoke solution and then turn it into a product and then sell it because they probably do something else like rent cars out. So I think that's really the biggest issue is it it's exciting to think about building your own solutions, kind of packing it all together. And we have the history of this, you know, you know, conspiracy theories, low probability events that are exciting, moving to LA to be a, a you know, an, an actor or an actress. These are all super exciting things. But the reality is, in the, in the real world, the, the, the boring solutions win. A great example is Python. Python is actually, a, in some sense, a horrible language, right? It's super slow. There's no real concurrency solution, but it's the most popular language in the world because things regress to the mean and the, the boring solutions win. Likewise, Jira is a great example. Most people hate Jira, but companies <laughs> gravitate towards the boring solutions that work. Okay. Yes. Yes. Or I'm seeing the chat is starting to light up. I love this. So for anybody that wants to add some points that you feel are not being said, we're going to go over those at the end. All right. So throw in there some of the different talking points that you feel are not being talked about enough. And we're going to put them in the end. We're going to mention all of them. But next up, Cheyenne, where you at? Where you at, man? You Put got, me in again. You got some me in there. Work. Oh, yeah. One minute on the clock. Let's do it. Okay. Um, so real quick, I think Python is actually a really great example for best in breed. Um, let, me, let me explain. Um, yeah, everyone tends to use Python. It, it's not a great language, absolutely. We regress to the mean totally. Um, but I'm sure most of the data scientists here have like pip installed pandas, pip installed numpy. Uh, all that numerical processing is actually not written in Python. It's actually written in C. Um, and you've got like a, a, a you know an interface between the Python and the C to actually do the, the number crunching. So um, in that case, the best tool did win. Um, Python wasn't used for the things that people typically use Python for these days. It's actually C under the hood. Um, and I also think that it also makes a very good argument for an integration layer. Uh, my opinion, personally, and, and that of my company, and I think several others, is that um, what we really want to see is tighter integrations between lots of different best-of-breed tools. And the question is, how do we achieve that? Well, we come up with a common interface for all of these things to communicate. Um, Onyx did the same thing for you know, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and so on, recognizing that some folks have just differing opinions about which platform they'd like to use. And that's okay. As long as these things can work together and have a common interface amongst them, then it all works just fine. So I think in terms of choose the most boring technology, I don't even think that exists in machine learning today. It's just so new. And MLOps is still like kind of a new concept that that boring technology still doesn't exist. What we have are end-to-end -end platforms that try to do a lot, but don't cover most of you know, kind of like the more interesting and, and more valuable use cases that lots of companies have. And you've got best in breed tools that actually do need those integrations amongst themselves. Um, and they, frankly, they're, they're doing a, an okay job at it right now. But I think what we're going to see over time is that we're going to have common interfaces amongst all these tools uh, emerge as we sort of um, build up more of a grammar around ML ops. I like it. Okay. And the chat right now is going off. I love this. I love seeing everything that we see. James just brought up an excellent point, but I don't want to derail you too much, Pindu. You're up next. But James, incredible point in the chat. What's the difference between an integration layer and a flexible end-to-end -end offering? All right. Pindu, you don't have to answer that question. Happy I want to, you to give us to. a minute. Give us a minute on Here your rebuttal. Minute. Here we go. All right. All right. Here we go. So actually, actually, we're mostly agreeing, not disagreeing from what I can tell. Let's start with saying that Dan basically said, hey, if there is an entry and platform that exists and actually works, that's great. It's all marketing hype. There's none that exists. I actually disagree. 
for most common enterprise use cases, whether it's churn, forecasting, personalization, NLP, text summarization, vision segmentation, or you know, object identification, which by the way is almost 90 to 100% of use cases for common uh, companies. These are not AI first companies. These are not open AI. This is not stability. This is someone like Macy's. This is someone like FedEx. This is someone like Procter & Gamble. Uh, you know, the end-to-end uh, -end MLOps does exist. These uh, these use cases are, uh, a lot of them are structured data use cases. Some of them are deep learning use cases. For those kinds of people where it's not one data scientist, they have more like, you know, 20 to 100 data scientists. It exists today, it works, it's in production, right? And I think more or less everybody agrees that for those use cases, uh, there are uh, there are platforms that exist, uh, I, you know, those platforms are great. And yes, I also agree with Chayan, there's actually innovation required there. We should make it so that there is more and more innovation in those end-to-end -end MLOps use cases as well. And, you know, people, there should be more companies doing that and that sort of thing. And to the question, which is like, what's the difference between an MLOps platform and like, you know, actually that integration layer? I actually think there isn't because a lot of end-to-end -end MLOps platforms do take in open source APIs. For example, we would be integrating into stability. So, you know, I think we agree there. I think uh, in terms of like, you know, uh, AI first companies, in terms of like open AI, in terms of like stability, of course you can't use an end-to-end -end MLOps platform today because, you know, they have diverse needs and you have to then go see what makes sense for you. But, you know, fundamentally the debate though is like what happens for use cases which are standard, which are prevalent, not just uh, standard, but they're also prevalent, they're universal. And for companies, which are kind of what I would say, kind of like brick and mortar companies, right? Whose actual like, you know, uh, focus is not AI, but AI is a big enabler. enabler. Think actually Shopify. Um, classic example, Shopify is used by tons and tons of e-commerce companies. And it's one platform. It does everything. It does all kinds of stuff from, you know, getting orders, uh, you, know, you know, fulfilling those orders, making inventory decisions, doing fraud management. And it's a $50 billion company. Another example of an end-to-end a platform which works for that particular industry. So I think in, in some sense in this debate, we're actually converging and agreeing to like what makes sense for you based on who you are. Strong points. This is good. Dan, you're gonna bring us home, man. This is, it's all on you. Last one, one minute on the clock. <laughs> So I think, look, the, sim the simplest thing to say here is that uh, it exists for simple use cases, but even in those kinds of use cases, um, you know, your monitoring and management of bringing in someone like Arise or Y Labs or TrueAira or any of the kind of companies, for instance, in the yeah, Infrastructure Alliance, that monitoring and management is just simply going to be infinitely more robust than whatever is baked into, you know, a, a normal platform. It's just as simple as that. So even for simple use cases, I would argue that it, it doesn't really exist at this point. I think I, you know, I agree with Bindu that if it does exist, we want it. And eventually an, an ecosystem does evolve to that, right? In other words, you, you get to the point where you have a VMware in the space and then everybody just writes to the API of that thing. But we're just in the, we're in the diffusion of innovation curve right now where we're in the early stage and it doesn't exist. We haven't figured out all the best ways to do distributed trading or experimentation tracking or, or you know, maybe we've done deployment pretty well, uh, you know, versus some of the other things, but, you know, it's, it's scaled inferencing, those kinds of things. We just haven't really nailed it and, and there's still development that's happening. So how can we possibly have a finished system at this point in time, and certainly if you have diverse use cases, it's not enough to say, well, it kind of exists for the for the small folks, you know, who are just doing, you know, one or two use cases. What happens when they expand into another use case? What happens is they buy another platform. And then when you certainly get into more complex use cases, it simply, it just simply doesn't exist at this point in time. And so, again, there's a delta between a desire for something to exist um, and, and it actually existing. And it will happen. We'll get to the LAMP stack of AI, and then we'll move up the stack to, you know, higher orders of abstraction, uh, just like, you know, people moved up the stack and went to WordPress and then moved up the stack and had Divi and a drag and drop editor. So any idiot like me can, who has very limited design skills can make something. And we're just not even at that WordPress level of abstraction yet. Uh, and uh, where we've standardized on, on kind of the best ways to do things because the best ways are still developing. Beautiful. Beautiful. That is it for the debaters we're going to bring them all on to the stage right now and we're going to get the questions and all of these chat things that we've got in happening but 
maybe before we do, well, no, no, no. We're going to throw the poll up right now again while we're talking about the different chat questions that are happening. So I saw Noah, Noah was being um, kind of funny in the chat. Noah, what, what were you mentioning there? Hell is hiring? Well, I mean, I, I don't know how many people have managed companies. I think a few of you have, you know, the life cycle of a company that is on, on its success and then it goes on its way down. But hiring for multiple languages, multiple technologies, it has killed organizations I've worked at for sure. And, and I would say the boring solutions are the ones that actually you can hire for. And you're also betting on the technology uh, provider increasing the feature. So even if they're not there at first, it's, look at Facebook. And we have some people that know Facebook. Facebook just you know, got in, got in a good relationship with the uh, Obama administration and then bought all the competitors. And then still they just right today, just steal all the features of everybody, everybody else. So that strategy does work. <laughs> so, so I, I, I mm. that's, that's basically what I'm saying is that the boring solution where the platform buys up all the competitors is, is a pretty well-known solution. And that is echoing the sentiment of what Chuck was saying about Jira versus Salesforce and how they're all just basically giant collections of extensions and stealing one from another. Uh, there's a few other great <laughs> things in the chat that uh, I'm seeing right now. We've got William saying, one thing that should be considered often an ML team is building in the context of an existing engineer stack. In that case, it may be difficult to work with a third-party end-to-end platform if it's not flexible enough. So there's yeah. another point. Like, Anybody want to yeah, talk I about that? I, I, we encounter this all the time. I think that's a really good solid point. Uh, you know, to the point of like, there ex being existing infrastructure, you, you want ideally a platform which can integrate at whatever like part of the Lego brick land, right? If you, you, know, if you have something which does uh, training and deployment, and you want somebody to do the feature store, you want you ideally want a, you want a platform which is easily extensible, but is also modular. And to Dan's point, I feel like, are we there there? Probably not. This is an innovative field. Uh, to, we'll get there sooner or later, but uh, you, know, you also want flexibility and customization. So you can't just switch off whatever you have. Hmm. So there's an, Angel is giving uh, something that I, want to mention in the chat and he's talking about how ml is supposed to provide this differentiating factor with the business right and if we're all using the same tool and it's some end-to-end -end tool doesn't that just make it so that we're all doing the same thing at the end kind of like when you're everyone in the tour de france is doping <laughs> it's just how good of a doper are you I have my thoughts on this, but I don't think it is quite that simple of a narrative. Anybody want to jump in on that? Do you mind if I jump in again on this one and then I'll shut Yeah, up. go for it. So uh, that's the same as saying if I use Figma, I don't have an advantage if I'm doing design. Like the MLOps platform is just a tool. All your advantage is in your data. And so if you, I mean, fundamentally, the data that you have and extracting signal pattern from that data is what is the differentiator, right? That being said, of course, there are techniques. And MLOps doesn't mean that you can't use techniques. You, it doesn't mean that you can't do distributed training. It doesn't mean that you can't use neural architecture, a search of different types. So I think using a tool is very different uh, from like actually innovating on that tool. Uh, and so you can't just say, hey, just because I'm using the same platform, me and you know, Macy's and Neiman Marcus are the same. I, I want to quickly jump in. Um, I, I agree with the sentiment um, that you know, just because like two people use a hammer doesn't mean that th their work is going to be exactly the same. Um, however, I, I think I disagree with the sentiment that all of the values in the data, and this is coming from someone whose company like focuses on the data side of this. Um, the, the data is like naturally very, very important, but also is the treatment of that data and yeah. the way you're no, able I agree. to apply Sorry. I mean, script, I, right? I agree. Techniques are important too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that if you're bounded by like a solution, if you're bounded by a platform that has a ceiling to the types of techniques that you can apply yeah. to your data, then that's like fundamentally problematic. That's terrible. Um, yeah. So, so 
Kass is asking, what are the boring off-the-shelf tools that people like and are using? Maybe there's a top three or top five list. And it maybe doesn't have to be in just ML. Who's got it? Dan or Noah? I, well, I would just say the, the, I mean, it's just look at the data, right? I mean, look at the, the top uh, vendors of cloud computing and whatever your company is currently using, just pick what they have. If it's AWS, you're already on AWS, pick SageMaker. If you're on Azure, pick Databricks or pick uh, Azure ML Studio. If you're on uh, Google, pick Vertex AI. I mean, that that may not be the exciting answer that people want to know, but that's going to be a pretty safe strategy. That, it's, that it's, yeah, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because I just talked to the SageMaker team about stability, where we have a four thousand uh, node A one hundred cluster, and uh, unfortunately, SageMaker won't work for what we're doing. Um, in other words, their thing is primarily structured data, and it can't handle uh, any of the image, audio, and video that we're handling. And in fact, we're even talking to the team on the back end, who is, is quite wonderful, that has a whole series of unreleased scripts and monitoring and management systems that they use for supercomputing clusters, uh, where they basically have kind of automations for when like the chips start to die down or, or need to be rebooted and, and those kinds of things. And then you look across you know, the pond and there are other groups that you know, have focused entirely on, on things like that, like CoreWeave, where we have a lot of our inferencing. Uh, and and they have all these kind of scripts sort of built in because that's all they do is sort of GPU sort of supercomputers, right? So again, it sort of it boils down to you're you're right. Like Mindu has said this earlier. Like if you have a sort of, I, I don't think there's a, this is not a matter of the I, I, like I disagree with the boring set of tools. In other words, I'll take the boring set of tool any day. I back in the day I'd take VMware over anything. I'm not going to go spin up my own you know virtualization cluster just because Zen is cooler, right? Um, but in this case, I'm saying it doesn't exist for a lot of things. It exists. The boring use case exists. Absolutely. And, you know, if, you're got, if you've got, you know, again, churn prediction and, and these kinds of sort of like, you know, analysis that everybody's doing, I think, you know, you're going to go to data roll, are you going to go to SageMaker, are you going to go, you know, Vertex, where you're going to do these kinds of things. And yeah, it's going to work absolutely fine. But I think as soon as you get into like, you know, cutting edge ML and those kinds of things, or you're, you're just kind of, you're, you're yeah. just out of luck. Well, I agree with, yeah. so we're actually in agreement, but, but you're talking about the 1% use case and I'm talking about the 99% use case. It would be like saying, hey, look, if you want to make $10 million and, and fly uh, private, uh, private planes each year and actually be a, an NFL quarterback, there's only one thing you can do is try out for the NFL. It's like, you're right. But the 5,000 other high school athletes should probably study math or they should probably study data science. So similarly, the 99% of companies should use the boring technology. If it is the case, if you're the one in the 100 companies that actually is trying to compete with Google or hugging face with take, making pre-trained models, then yeah, don't, don't use the platform. <laughs> but, but that's 1% but that's of the people. Uh, but I don't know if it's one percent, though. I think that's unfair. <laughs> but but maybe. yeah, I don't know if it's one percent. But I also like. Let me actually, uh, for, you know, uh, counter Noah <laughs> a little bit here. The point the point is <laughs> friendly <laughs> fire. You guys are on the same team. You can't counter <laughs> Noah. <laughs> well, we still agree. It's gone overall. off the rails. <laughs> No, it's not. So uh, basically, uh, big tech, I mean, I see kind of big tech as a Walmart, right? And I, I agree with this thing that they're, uh, they're actually boring. And they're actually even SageMaker, to be honest, or Vertex aren't there there yet. An example of this is uh, data warehouses. The best data warehouse there is a Snowflake. Uh, and it's, it's something, somebody else. So I think just because it's part of Google or because of Amazon, you shouldn't adopt it. I, I am for end-to-end -end ML platform, ML ops platforms. I would, it, it makes sense for it to be the best of breed end-to-end -end ML ops platform. I don't know which one it is yet. I think the jury is out there, right? But I think just adopting the Google tool or the Amazon tool doesn't make sense because Amazon and Google are just praying and praying right now. I mean, it's every everywhere in every area, there is some tool that they are uh, developing and they have like 10 people on that tool and the tool is not great, right? So I think that shouldn't be the reason to use it just because big tech is using it or because it's boring technology. I think we should figure out what is, if A, does it exist? B, is it really good for my task, for my problems and my models? And then C, okay, then let's go adopt it. Yeah, um, so really quickly, um... I think that there's a lot of talk about the distribution of types of problems in the AI space. I, I think like everyone here, both panelists and attendees, probably want more proliferation and more penetration of AI into um, interesting business use cases. Even if you're a Macy, you're, even if you're a Macy's, even if you're a GM, even if you're you know whatever insert big incumbent you know company here, 
uh, there exists some set of problems within your organization that are extremely high value that you simply can't build AI for very easily because you either lack the tooling or you lack the data or some combination of the two. Now, I think everyone here wants those use cases to be solved for using AI. Um, I think that's sort of a given. So I think really what we should be arguing for is just deep innovation where we bring kind of like the floor up. And I think that's really what we're talking about here, especially like from the camp of best of breed, because that's sort of like the most linear path towards that. You know, if we can focus on these ultra high value use cases, then it's possible for these companies to basically be priced into solving really their hardest problems using AI. Okay, so before Dan jumps in, because I know he wants to say something, everybody, just to let you know, we've got the second round of the polls. So I want to see if there has been any change in the way that you would vote. Go answer the polls again it's the same question but let's have you changed your mind did you get swayed one way or another and remember i told you come into this with an open mind be willing to change your mind all right because it'd be no fun if everybody just held to their morals and they said ah i don't believe it just because they <laughs> are uh, aggressively holding on to it like a belief Dan, what was you got... the score for the best? Sorry, just I had a question. What was the best oh, score for the initial poll? So just, I mean, the I initial one, it, so. it was 72% yeah. for uh, end to end. And then I think 28% was. No, 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 other no, way around. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Vice versa. <laughs> I was close on that. Just like, Steph, yeah. nice try, man. Just kind of messing it up for everybody. Look, the. Um, <laughs> like I, I'd like to thank all my worthy, you know, competitors. We're not really competitors, as, as Noah said. On any given day, depending on our paycheck, we could certainly switch to the other side of the debate, like good sophists from ancient Greece. Um, I will say though that uh, you know, best of breed is something that I I actually do sort of buy into and believe in because you know my study with uh, in the AI infrastructure lines and so many folks that I've worked with, and I think it really does come back to the diffusion of innovation curve and where we're at in in the thing. And eventually you do get to like two or three tools that just everybody uses. It makes sense. The LAMP stack is there. Why are you going to go reinvent the wheel? But I think actually the perfect example of that to do is, is Snowflake and that Snowflake is like a very late stage product where, where there were already two or three generations that exist. And the same way that Kubernetes is like a third stage product yep. versus like two internal systems that Google built. So, right. and in fact, I think somebody tweeted the other day that Snowflake had made one of the funniest um, uh, like value props in the early days that they said, they just came in and they're like, it's it's like Redshift, but it works and you don't have to think <laughs> about it. And, and, and really that was, that was actually yep. their pitch. And people were like, yep. Like you don't have fancy slides and like a bunch of demos. And they're like, no, no, no. We just make it so you never have to think about running out of space or replication or whatever. And it took Redshift existing for Snowflake to exist, right? And, and by the way, Snow, you know, Red, Redshift is still a pretty cool product and continues to improve. But, you know, Snowflake is on an order of magnitude of just awesomeness uh, that's better. And it, it's because it's later in the, the development stage. Of later in the development stage, yeah. You get to learn from the mistakes people made, right? Like if you look at the data robots and stage makers of the world, the next generation, we believe strongly. I mean, you're making my case personally, selfishly for me, but yes, absolutely agree. <laughs> so uh, Troy just said something incredible in the comments and I have to relay this to everyone in case they're not looking at it. The real debate here is not quite there yet end-to-end -end platform versus box of parts that don't work that well together <laughs> that's that's 100 uh, yeah that's, that's it that's real that's reality right there that is actually yeah reality. i agree i agree and that and that's but that's the whole point from an ec microeconomics standpoint right is is who is going to actually be the person that's going to be successful it's probably the company with the most money Ooh. Oh, that's that's so depressing. Really it is depressing, yeah. but it's well, just... You can't end us on that, man. Like, you know, the... <laughs> yeah. We can't end on that. Actually, what How about the best meritocracy on... and the best people? No, I think <laughs> the company is the most amount of innovation. Let's go with what Shia has said, innovation. I That's know. right. Yeah. <laughs> we, we can dream. We can dream. Okay, so great. let's okay. end on the poll. Let's see. The results are in. I think we can throw them up on the screen. And what do we got here? What do we have as far as the poll results? 
is it oh oh so <laughs> end to end was swayed now more people are going for end to end i don't know if that's because more people just showed up <laughs> late and they voted for end to end or if they actually were swayed. Hindu sent out a mail to all of her phone numbers <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, stack in the deck <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe there were some shenanigans going on on the back end here no, no, i didn't cheat i promise <laughs> noah told all his students if they want extra credit get on here and vote for end to end <laughs> well this has been awesome y'all this has been super cool hopefully everyone enjoyed it i gave away a few different books i think i gave away three of them but in case i didn't i'll give away a fourth to i mean i see Chuck here gave an awesome uh, point up above. So Chuck, where are you at? Chuck, you get a book. And also William, you get some points. When That was awesome. Last person, David Palmer, you get some points. We're all going away from this with a good time. Hopefully that was uh, excellent. It was as good as... <laughs> no, I, it was as good for you as it was for me. And we're going to finish... On that note, I think we've got uh, we've got Thomas from Weights and Biases coming up. Sam, you're gonna you're gonna bring in Thomas, right? Oh yeah, yep. All right, here we go. Awesome. <laughs> How was it? How was it for you, Sam? That was amazing. I was off screen having a ball here, also in the chat, uh, which was very lively. So big thanks to our audience for uh, engaging and keeping it lively. And thank you, Demetrios, and all of our debaters this morning for a very lively conversation. Thanks for having us. This is a lot of fun. See you all later. <laughs>